In Northern California, Stanford University professor Chris Gerdes is hard at work in his favorite lab, the racetrack, trying to make cars safer. I hear you are messing around with automotive safety issues. I'm trying some new ideas. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. A racing car just went by. It looks like he's enlisted the help of an unflappable driver who never flinches in the face of danger. He's really pushing that car to its limits. I'm dying to meet this intrepid maniac who seems willing to do anything in the name of science. Hey, that was really... What? Come on! There is no driver! What have you done? What kind of satanic ritual is this? This is Shelly, our self-driving Audi TTS. Self-driving racing car. That's right. There's no one at the wheel. Shelly drives herself. And even though she's got a lead foot and a sweet tooth for squealing tires, her whole purpose in life, or in silicon anyway, is to keep human drivers alive. It may sound crazy, but Chris designed this robotic speed demon in order to make our cars safer. After all, we take a calculated risk every time we get behind the wheel. Look at all the terrible drivers out there. So, is there an alternative? What if our cars could drive themselves? That brings us back to Shelly. Turns out she's not just a piece of amazing engineering. She actually helps Chris study how to push a car to the very limits of physical performance without losing control. One of the things that's inspired us is to look at how the very best drivers control the car. So we've looked at race car drivers who are able to get every bit of the friction between the tire and the road. Many accidents occur when tires lose their grip, when the forces needed to keep the car on the road overwhelm the force of friction. That can put the car into a spin or make it impossible to steer. Race car drivers are masters of the road. They push their cars to the limit, at the very edge of control. In racing, you get to the limits of the car's capabilities because you're trying to be fast. In ordinary driving, you may get to the limits of the car's capabilities simply because you're on an icy road. The exact same physics apply in these two cases. So Chris wondered, what if he could transfer the reflexes of a race car driver into the operating system of a regular car? That would be like giving the ordinary driver a computer co-pilot to take over whenever the car begins to lose its grip. But how would he do that? His first step was to wire high-performance cars with sensors and have race car drivers speed around the track as fast as possible, right up to the point of skidding out of control. The sensors recorded how the pros steer, accelerate, and brake. Then, Chris translated that driving prowess into software for Shelly's onboard computer. Her two GPS antennas, accelerometers, gyroscopes, and other sensors feed her computer real-time data about position and speed. The computer then sends commands to the steering system, throttle, and brakes. OK, seeing is believing. Unfortunately, Chris seems to think that riding is believing, and he wants to put my life in the hands of Shelly's computer. We're off. Just like a big, expensive toy. OK, and so you're, you're, you're I'm not doing anything right now. I, this is not slowing down very much at the curb. No, we really don't have to. He just went off the road, dude. If you don't go up on the rimble strip, then you're slow. Any race car driver will tell you that. What a smart little car. Shelly is constantly adjusting her position on the track. Her adjustments just aren't very smooth. But I guess smooth doesn't matter if your only priority is staying on the road. Chris. <laughs> Stop me. You OK? <laughs> oh, my god. Fortunately, Chris can take over at any time.
But understanding how the best drivers drive is only part of the equation. Chris needs to know more about how ordinary accident-prone drivers perform in order to figure out how a computer might help them out. So he and his team have developed another car. Welcome to X1. This is an entirely student-built research vehicle that we're using to develop some of the algorithms for Shelley. It's cool. It's kind of like a kind of like a dune buggy effect. Researchers can test all kinds of driving conditions with the X1 by controlling each wheel individually to simulate a change in friction between the tire and the road. The rear wheels actually steer out, causing the car to go into a spin, and we watch the reaction of the driver to correct that. All right, so you're going to take us for a ride? Well, no, David, we'd really like to get your data. So we'd like to wire you up and have you drive the car. Oh, so the test subject is me. Shocker. We're going to put some EEG recording electrodes on your scalp so we can uh, check out your brain activity as you drive X1 around the skid pad. See I, know, what, I think uh, my brain activity might blow out your equipment. These electrodes won't reveal what I'm thinking, but they'll record patterns in my brain activity an indication of how hard my brain is working. I'll be back. And now I meet my co-pilot. I'll be messing with you a little bit. <laughs> well, I've designed the experiment that we're going to be doing. And while we're driving, I'll be collecting your data here on this computer. Are we ready? Whenever she wants, Holly can take control of any of the four wheels. Any moment now, she'll make the X1 behave as though we've hit a patch of ice. Okay, there you go. The squealing is okay. Not bad. This is where Holly triggered the rear wheels to go through a very sharp angle change to make you feel like you're starting to spin out. There's an abrupt change in my brain waves, suggesting I've become super focused on controlling the car. So focused that if this were a real life situation, I might not notice something as obvious as an oncoming bus. This data could lead to cars that know just when to step in to bail human drivers out of hairy situations. Which reminds me, I have one final question about self-driving Shelly. How does she stack up? against a real pro. Let's find out. David Vodden has 50 years of experience and knows this track inside and out. But to set a high benchmark, I'm going to take the first lap. Good exit, good line. Two minutes, 51 seconds. You've set the mark for this race, and we'll see how the others do. Woohoo! 2.51. I'd like to see a piece of software beat that. Time to beat is 2.51, old man. Old oh, man. A professional driver relies on experience, intuition, and the feel of the road. He's always thinking ahead. This is the warm-up lap. This is his warm-up lap? He pushes the car to its limits and smoothly reins it back in. Two nineteen point three. Two nineteen. This is a little bit faster by a little more than thirty seconds. Well, you're using a phone instead of a real clock. That's why. Neutral. Start the model. Now Shelley's handlers prep her Hello, for the big moment. You're now able to exit the vehicle. Unmanned vehicle on the track. Shelly makes 200 calculations a second to determine her correct speed and brake point based on the available friction. Robotic ghost driven vehicle. When our cars are this smart, we'll be a lot safer. So who won, man or machine? In third place, with a time of 2 minutes and 51 seconds, David Pogue. In second place, with a time of 2 minutes and 21 seconds, Shelly. 
And today's winner, with two minutes and 19 seconds, David Vaden. Today, man beat machine by just two seconds. But Chris is confident that Shelly will beat even the best of us someday soon and make the cars we drive much safer. That is, if we manage to hang on to our spot behind the wheel at all. It may seem like the stuff of a science fiction movie. How can I be of service, Detective? Just tell your car where you want to go and let it do the driving. But that day may not be far off. Google already has a fleet of self-driving cars that have logged several hundred thousand miles on surface streets and freeways. They're already officially street legal in California, Nevada, and Florida. Someday, robotic cars may virtually eliminate traffic accidents. But for now, driving is an unavoidable risk that most of us accept, even though some 35,000 people a year will die on the road in the United States.